This is the 11th video on first order modelling. This video is going to look at stirred tanks or heat exchangers. So we're looking at these because they're quite common in the process industry and therefore an important system to know about. Now in many cases a stirred tank will be acting as a heat exchanger and you'll see from the diagram down here that you may have some cold liquid entering at one side you will have some mixing going on in the tank, so there's a mixer. You will have some heat supply, and then that will obviously heat up what's in the tank, and you've got hot liquid coming out the other side. So the intention of this system is clearly to get an output flow at a desired temperature. Now before we model this, we need to think about how are we going to do it? And generally speaking, with these process problems, we've used balance equations. Now, because this is a heat exchanger, the most logical balance to do is in terms of energy. Now, the energy supply could be electrical, so that's the heater, or it could be in some other form. And that's something you need to be careful about when you model a system in general. We are going to use steam as the main uh, source of heat for the example shown here, but there are cases where it may be electrical and you'll need a slightly different model. Now, for simplicity, these slides assume that the volume in the tank is constant. So that is the flow in equals the flow out. And again, as in earlier videos, if this assumption is not true, you need to look at your modeling um, and just be a little bit careful because the model will be slightly more complicated. All right then, let's uh, revisit this diagram and just check exactly what's going on. What we want to do is ascertain the temperature, and I'm going to put it here, capital T, of the fluid or the liquid in the tank. And we will assume that that's the same temperature as the output flow. We'll have some something coming in which we'll say has got temperature T in. Now the heat supply is going to be given as power or watts. I'm going to assume also that the particular tank has got a volume V. And what we'll do is use an energy balance to find out what's going on in this system. But the most important thing is that you recognize where the variables ascertain to. So here we have T in, temperature of the liquid coming in, T, the temperature in the tank, and the temperature going out, so we assume that the tank is well mixed, and we have heat coming in from this heater, and uh, we'll probably call that sorry, a capital W, something like that, for the power input. So what assumptions might we make? We've already done this one, the flow in equals the flow out, and therefore the volume in the tank is constant, and we're assuming the tank is well mixed, so the temperature in the tank is the same as the output temperature. We'll assume we know the specific heat of the liquid flowing through the tank. So that's going to be written as joules per kilogram per degree. We'll assume we know the density of the liquid. So here we've said that's going to be rho kilograms per meter cubed. And we'll assume we know the volume of the tank, V, and that's in meters cubed. <laughs> what about the heat supply? Now for this video, is we are going to assume that the heat is provided by condensing steam. Now there is a slight note here. Once the steam is condensed, the resulting water will continue to reduce in temperature and therefore provide some energy. However, we're going to argue that the amount of energy provided by the cooling down of the steam is negligible compared to the latent heat and therefore we're going to ignore that. It's probably of the order of magnitude of 10 to the minus 3 and therefore not really significant in terms of a model. Let's assume that the latent heat of the steam is lambda, and that's joules per kilogram. And we're going to let the steam flow rate into the heating cool be Q kilograms per second. And we're also going to assume that all the steam condenses. Let's start with the easy one. So if we do an overall mass balance through this heat exchanger, we've got the rate of change of mass in the tank depends upon mass flow in minus mass flow out. But you'll remember that we've assumed constant volume. We've assumed that the flow in equals the flow out. So in essence, 
this equation is going to disappear and we don't need to consider it. But clearly, if you had an example where fi was not equal to f, then this equation would come into play. And that's something you might want to do by yourself. What about en energy balance then? So we're going to do this in terms of watts or joules per second. So what have we got? We've got the power supplied in, so that's what's coming through the heat exchanger, plus the energy per second that's coming in the input flow has got to match the rate of change of energy stored in the tank plus the energy, and that's per second, of the output flow. So that's going to be our energy balance, or you might want to call it a power balance. So let's look at all these terms. First of all, we're going to do this one, the, the, uh, the power in. Well, the power in comes from the latent heat of the steam. So we said that lambda was the latent heat, um, and that was uh, per kilogram. And we had that Q was the flow rate of steam in kilograms per second. So the power that's coming from the steam has to be lambda Q. What about the energy coming in from the input flow? Well, we've got a flow rate F, we've got a density rho, so the mass flow rate is rho times F. We've got a specific heat of Cp, and we've got an input temperature of Ti, so you can see the energy per second from the input flow is rho times F times Cp times Ti. What next? What's the rate of change of energy stored in the tank? Well, we need the volume of the tank, that tells us how much fluid is or liquids in the tank, plus the density. So rho v, that's the mass of liquid in the tank. Again, we've got the specific heat, and then we've got the rate of change of temperature of the liquid in the tank. So the rate of change of energy stored in the tank is rho v cp times d capital T, dt. And finally, we've got the energy flow in the output stream, and you'll see this matches the term from the input stream, apart from you've got T instead of Ti. So there is our energy balance equation. So I've rewritten the energy balance equation here at the top. Oh, what's happened there? Something went wrong there. Oh dear. So we've rewritten the equation at the top here. Now what I'm going to do next is rearrange it into your typical time constant form. So you'll see what I've done is I've divided throughout. Oh, I'm doing it again. I've divided throughout by this term here, rho f c p. And by doing that, we end up with this equation here. V over F times dt dt plus capital T equals Ti plus lambda over rho FCP all times Q. And you'll notice this is almost in typical time constant form. So the time constant is this term here, V over F. But what's slightly different is you'll notice that we've got two inputs. We've got a Ti and we've got a Q. So that's why it's slightly more complicated than uh, the first order models we've dealt with before. So one of those inputs is the temperature of the input flow, and the second input is the flow rate of steam, which is uh, what's supplying the heat. Now, because this is a linear model, we can use superposition and analyze the impacts of each of these separately. And you'll also notice that each input has different gain. So the input temperature has an effective gain of 1. So in other words, in the steady state, the output flow temperature would match the input flow temperature if there was no heating, which is what you would expect, T equals Ti. You will also notice there's a gain associated with the heating. So as you increase the steam flow, so therefore you increase the energy into this heater, then the output temperature increases. Deviation variables then. In early videos we suggested it was better in general to use deviation variables about some steady state. Let's do that then. So first let's define the steady state. So first we've written our equation here but then you'll notice what I've done is I've said let the derivative equal zero because that gives us the steady state. And by setting the derivative equal to zero, I end up with this identity here, which defines the steady state. So the steady state output temperature will be equal to the steady state 
inflow temperature plus lambda over rho FCP times the flow rate of steam. Next, let's define the deviation variables and you'll see this is the same as earlier. So we've got T dash, the change in output temperature is the actual temperature minus the steady state. The change in inlet temperature, Ti dash, is, oh, and there should be an I on there, sorry about that, is the actual inlet temperature minus the steady state inlet temperature. And again, the uh, deviation in the steam flow is the actual steam flow minus the steady state steam flow. So these dash terms define the distances from the steady state. If I substitute those variables in, and again, you may be familiar that essentially this term here is T, this term here is T, this term here is Ti, and this term here is Qi. So that's fairly standard. And then what I do next is I eliminate what I know about the steady state. So this was the steady state equation we had. If I put that identity into here and remove the variables that therefore can be uh, cancelled, what I end up with is this equation at the bottom. And you'll notice, unsurprisingly, it looks like exactly the same equa equation that we had without the deviation variables. And that's not surprising because this is a linear model and therefore superposition applies. Let's look at a numerical example. Let's look at a numerical example. So what we've done here is we've supplied a large number of pieces of data. So we said the volume is three, the flow rate is 0.2 meters cube per second, the latent heat 2.3 times 10 to the six joules per kilogram, the density of the liquid 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed, the specific heat of the liquid 4,200 joules per degree, the inlet flow in steady state 20 degrees and the steam flow in steady state 10 kilograms per second. So what we need to do is substitute all of those numbers in to the model we've got. And you'll notice I'm using deviation variables, so I'm measuring about the steady state because that's usually what will happen. So what terms have we got? We need to know about V over F, and you can see that's 3 over 0 0.2, which is 15. And so what I'm going to do is I will be putting that 15 in there. I need this term here, lambda over rho FCP. And you see, if we put all the numbers in and go through the calculations, we get 2.74. So that number is going to be going in there. And finally, I need to establish what was the steady state temperature of the outflow, because I might need that at some point. So this was the steady state equation we derived on the previous page. So again, if I substitute in the numbers, what do you find? You find the steady state outlet temperature was 47.4. So having done all that, we substitute the numbers in, and this is the model we end up with. 15 dt dash dt plus t dash equals ti dash plus 2.74 q dash. Now, I've put a little note here just so you can see that this model is sort of what you expect. The gain from the inlet flow to the outlet flow is 1. That's what you would expect. And also the gain from the steam flow to the outlet temperature is 2.74. Now, when you think that the flow rate of the inlet is 200 kilograms per second, then actually a gain of 2.74 is roughly what you would have expected. So if you do some um, simple engineering intuition arguments, you will see why that is the case. So what have we got? This model's got a time constant of 15 seconds. And if we have a unit step in the inlet temperature, we're going to get a unit change in the outlet temperature because the gain between Ti and T is 1. So if I sketch that down here, you're going to end up with something roughly like this. So if I have a unit step in Ti, then T will go to 1. And if we mark the uh, sort of time scales we're talking about, it's going to be 15, 30, 45. So you'll notice I've done a sketch here using simple first order modeling, the way we've done on many previous slides, and said the response time is governed by the time constant. Um, the steady state is governed by the gain, which here is 1, and then we've done a simple sketch. What happens if we just have a change in steam flow? Well, it's unsurprising. We're going to get the same shape of curve. And again, I can put in my, uh, my numbers, 15, 
30.45 for the time scale, but the difference is that for a unit change in Q, the temperature will go to 2.74. Now just as an aside, I'm not going to dwell on it here, if you had a change in Ti and a change in Q, because this is a linear system, you could use superposition. And we should also remind you that what we've done here is we've done graphs in deviation variables. So to some conclusion, I've derived a model for a simple heat exchanger or a stirred tank mixing tank. The model is linear and takes a standard first order format but with a subtle variation that there are two inputs rather than one. The time constant, and you'll notice that down here, okay, is linked to the volume of the tank and the flow rate through the tank. And again, that's sort of intuitive, is what you would expect. The gain for the inlet temperature is 1, and again, that's what you would expect, whereas the gain for the steam flow depends on a number of factors. Obviously, the latent heat of the steam, but also the flow rate of the fluid going through the tank and the specific heat of the fluid going through the tank.